Good afternoon. I, I have the, the honor of uh, introducing one of the leading experts in the, in the issues that we are going to address in uh, the next 20 minutes. Uh, Manuel Orozco has been uh, just introduced uh, by Natasha. But um, uh, the topic is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, migration, the migration crisis, with a focus on remittances. But uh, I'd like, uh, first of all, to ask you, uh, what is the, the nature, uh, the composition, and uh, the scale of uh, this crisis, and how it has changed uh, in the recent years, let's say from 2015 till now? Well, th thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me, uh, Daniel Sovato, President Fernandez, and um, the colleagues that have been working on this uh, meeting. Um, I think one of the fascinating things about migration is that it was a subject of significant interest in the past 20 years because of the magnitude of the flow of people and the economic impact it was having on Latin American economies to the extent to which the migration became a key tool of connectivity in the global economy for Latin America. But in the past four years, especially since the post-pandemic period, since 2020, we see a, a crisis of migration in the sense that the, the scale, the composition of people moving, and the factors leading to explaining this migration have dramatically changed from previous years. And, and so we have, for example, from 2015 to 2022, an increase of Latin American migrants from 33 million to 45 million in just a short period of time. But four to five of those million of those people actually came between 2020 and 2022. Um, and we're talking about practically one in 12 people in Latin America have a relative living abroad, but really it's one in four households in Latin America that have a relative living abroad. So th there is a significant change in the, in the scale that we're talking about, but also, in terms of the, the distribution, there is a growth of migration coming from places outside um, of the traditional routes, like the United States. Although there has been a growth in Latin American migration to the United States, there is also a spread of migration to countries like Chile. For example, Chile, within a matter of four years, became the second largest migrant host country in the Americas. And uh, now you have two million migrants living in Chile. I mean, this is unheard of in the, in the history of migration in the Americas. We have migration to the Dominican Republic. In 2015, there were less than 3,000 Venezuelans in the DR. Now we have 120,000 Venezuelans. And that's just an example. You can go on and looking at those trends, Costa Rica, Panama, also becoming major migrant host countries. The other dynamic that is taking place is that um, in terms of the, the um, the composition of migration. What we see is that the type of people that are migrating are no longer adults. But we see that only half of the migrants that are leaving Latin America are adults. We're seeing single adults. We're seeing also family groups migrating uh, to uh, different places, to Chile, to the United States, etc. But one in 10 migrants is a minor. And many of those minors are actually migrating by themselves. And just to put this in perspective, there are more children, uh, unaccompanied minors, living in Central America than the annual increase of the matriculation of kids in those countries. The, the, the enrollment in Guatemala, for example, has been declining just at the same time since 2014, basically. Uh, in coincidence with the increase of unaccompanied minors living to the United States. I mean, this is just, a, this is, when you dimension this, this is a crisis. You know, that more people are leaving than staying in school. Um, and the, there are other important dynamics explaining this, but the, the, the other factor is the, the, the intention to migrate is no longer shaped by economics, but it's shaped by a complexity of issues that deals with climate change the poor resilience of the social uh, safety networks of the different states that was, basically came across to resurface during the COVID crisis, the state could not handle uh, social protections to, to its own citizens. But also the, 
the political, the, the state fragility that prevailed at the political level in many of these countries. And just to give you an idea, 25% of the migrants that have been living to the United States in particular in the past two years come from four countries, Haiti, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Between, let me give you just one example. Nicaragua is a country of less than 7 million people. Between 2021 and 2022, 400,000 people have left. This is, I mean, 400,000 out of nearly 7 million people, that's 7% of the population left in two years. Uh, and it's mostly political reasons, repression, et cetera. So you're left with the, the magnitude of this crisis. How do, you, how do you deal with that? And so you have a number of realities to, to, to confront it with, but basically, um, we are dealing with a major crisis. Now, we know now that uh, this is a particularly acute crisis, and it comes from some years back. It is linked to both uh, economic, environmental, political uh, reasons. Um, what do you have to say about possible solutions on how to address this crisis? Look, I think we, we have at least four different angles to this. One is humanitarian assistance. I mean, the, the, the magnitude of the flow of people uh, that you see, for example, the Venezuelans that went to Colombia and then from Colombia to other countries like Chile, Peru, Ecuador, the United States, are in desperate need of attention. Even the, the migrants that have come to the United States and are led into the United States who are detained at the border, I mean, this year we're talking about 2.4 million people that came to the US border as of September. Um, they, are, they cross the border, but then they are left basically uh, vulnerable without social protection, access to healthcare, not even access to vaccination, not access to uh, fair uh, employment opportunities, et cetera. So humanitarian assistance is the first step. The second one is one that deals with democracy and development. And this is fundamentally important. It, the Biden administration introduced this root strategy, uh, root causes strategy of migration approach that looked at rule of law, look at economic opportunities, um, gender equality, among other things. We need to implement that aggressively in the short term. Unfortunately, politics and polarization in the United States has not allowed to have a good approach to this, but we need to address especially the political conditions in these countries. The level of impunity that in countries like Nicaragua are taking place are pushing people out. And uh, it's the, the necessity to deal with that is important. Uh, an important component to development is also leveraging remittances. The importance of remittances uh, to the economies of Latin America is just today significant. As of 2022, 5% of the entire Latin America and Caribbean uh, GDP it's coming from remittances. I mean, that's 5%. In 2015, it was less than 1%. I mean, this is how important the flow of money has become. But formalizing those flows into savings to mobilize them into the local economy will have a tremendous impact because we know that asset building have a negative effect in the intention to migrate. So the, the third uh, area of, of response is regularization. You know, legalize migrants that are allowed to enter because it's the pathway towards greater access to opportunities in the host country. And with regularization, you also need to strengthen uh, strategies of social inclusion. For example, Haitians in Chile are struggling to integrate into a society that is not used to a different culture. Uh, but you have 300,000 Haitians in that country right now. And you have to address issues of social inclusion. Uh, the same thing even for Venezuelans in Colombia. Even though you seem to think you will assume that they are similar or look similar, well, there are cultural differences that matter and create tensions to the extent to which today Venezuelans in Colombia are the largest minority in Colombia above the Afro-Colombian population. Uh, and the fourth one uh, is working with cities, a transnational approach to cities because at the end of the day, Human mobility, labor mobility is connected to city to city. So, for example, 
Uh, people from a particular town in Tibuca in Honduras go to Washington, D.C. Um, those connectivities are important factors of economic development, but also social progress. So those four approaches are fundamental as a first step level. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. I, I would like to place this in, uh, in the broader context. We are talking here of uh, the hemisphere and uh, in particular uh, the, the Latin America and the Caribbean as countries of origin. Uh, but uh, we all know that uh, at the United Nations over the last years, uh, this has been one of the key themes uh, in the global conversation. Uh, there has been, uh, before the pandemic, uh, one uh, of the main uh, uh, policy fora uh, on uh, exactly this topic, uh, safe uh, and orderly and regular uh, migrations and what the international community could do uh, for that. Uh, both your diagnosis and the solutions actually mirror some of the key problems uh, that also in other regions are being addressed. Uh, International IDEA is working in uh, Africa, uh, for example, and, uh, and also North Africa and the, the, uh, the Middle East, and uh, I can see there many elements that in fact overlap, both in terms of the composition and the nature. There are con con context specific elements, but I would like to look also the commonalities. Uh, from our perspective, uh, there was uh, in May, back in May, uh, the uh, International Migration Review Forum, uh, that is a mechanism that monitors implementation of uh, the commitments uh, adopted uh, uh, at the UN on that topic. Uh, one of the issues that we wanted to stress as international idea is the political agency of migrants. This is very important uh, with respect to one element that you mentioned uh, under the third point of your solutions, which is integration taking into account also the cultural context. So what, what is your opinion about a culture of democracy and the political participation of migrants, both in the countries of origin where they can uh, vote and in the context where they are integrated? Well, it's, it's important, but very truncated in reality. Uh, what, what we see, for example, is that migrant communities or diasporas, as we use it sometimes euphemistically, um, struggle to integrate in the host country, partly because many of them do not have citizenship rights. They don't have, they haven't naturalized. Uh, at the same time, they try to maintain ties with their homeland. And in the case of Latin America, of the 34 Latin American and Caribbean countries, less than half actually enable dual nationality or dual citizenship and the right to vote abroad. Yet, they implicate themselves in local politics in the hometown. And, and it's a fascinating reality because that, in, that engagement with the hometown uh, is very politicized. So a Dominican group here in New York is connected to a few uh, hometowns in the Dominican Republic. Uh, but, but the fascinating part is that the way in which they connect is that it's a hybrid connection. They use the social capital they grew up here they translate it over there for political favors, for clientelistic purposes. So you're not actually exporting the values of democracy, but you are leveraging your social capital here to influence local politics there. And it's, it's fascinating because at the end of the day, you're reinforcing what we don't want in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is happening in a lot of places. I mean, we have projects in Central America, in Guatemala, for example, working in education projects with the Guatemalan diaspora. And they tell us, we want to work with this mayor. I said, that's great. When we find out is that that mayor has a friend who has a friend that will get a job through that relationship with the hometown association. And so, you know, all those clientelistic ties undo the democratic ideal. So, so it's, it's somewhat truncated. And within that context, you also have migrants demanding the right to vote abroad. And governments do not want to enable it. Um, that is, they may have passed the law, but obedezco pero no cumplo. Because they, they don't really invest the resources to have their citizens living abroad to vote. 
And so, you know, <laughs> what does it mean to really have the right to vote abroad, for example, in a country like Nicaragua, which, you know, legally has it, but Nicaraguans cannot vote. And now we're talking about one million Nicaraguans abroad in a country of seven million. Um, so, you know, these are the paradoxes of contemporary politics. Well, that is extremely interesting. Did you um, see also any differences between, uh, uh, in an historical perspective, between different generations of migrants with respect to this particular element of political engagement and uh, uh, how they exercise their rights and how they see also their agency in, in, in politics? Well, I think one of the important, uh, I've been working on this for just over 30 years. And when I started looking at it, um, the clientelistic practice was more predominant. Now, there is a newer generation of migrants that first they prioritize making it in the United States. Second, they want to forge ties with the homeland, but more than the right to vote abroad, they want to have a voice in the national development plans because what they say is that they don't want their relatives and their families to go through the same experience they went through to having to migrate, to leave their countries. So that, that's, a, that's a major difference that we're seeing. Um, there is also a demographic difference. Younger people are migrating, and the extent to which they want to reconnect to their homelands, um, it's relatively uncertain. One thing that, I, that we're finding out today, for example, in the four nationalities that I told you, Haitians, Cubans, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans, is that once you leave, you kiss your country goodbye. So in the context of transnational engagement, because of the trauma of having left by force, um, it's just you don't want to deal with that country. And at the same time, you do send money. So it's like, you know, I have to send money to my mother, but I want nothing to do with that country at the same time. So how do you reconcile those realities? This is what this generation is struggling with. So they're resorting to technology, social media. So the connectivity that you see in the diaspora through uh, Facebook, through WhatsApp, I mean, is fascinating. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, actually, that was the next question that I would have liked to pose you, but you have already replied. I wanted to know about the remittances and whether they play any influence uh, in the diaspora, in, in local politics. Uh, and whether you may uh, identify there a, a trend for the future. Maybe in one word, and then we, we close this uh, session. They, they make a major difference. I mean, they are really improving the household's uh, quality of life. They are yet to have a significant development impact. That is, remittances have the capacity to increase wealth, provided that there are incentives in the local economy, in the in financial intermediation markets, to mobilize those savings into investments. But governments are still not interested in doing that because of what the previous panel uh, participants have mentioned, that there is just still deeply embedded issues of inequality. And, and so you know, it's still a challenge to deal with. Thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, I think it was very insightful. Although we only spent 20 minutes, I, I uh, at least uh, have uh, something that I take away from this conversation. Context matters, it is changing rapidly, the crisis mounted over the last years, but we have to continue to monitor this and try to uh, manage also this crisis. A big round of applause to, to Manuel Orozco. Thank you very much. Thank you.